everyone, and welcome to this year's third My IBD Learning Virtual Program, Gut Friendly Diets, What's Right for Me? My name is Macy Stahl. I'm a graduate student at the University of Virginia and co-chair of the Foundation's National Council of College Leaders. Each, each of this year's My IBD Learning Virtual Programs will surround the topic of how to achieve IBD remission. Prior to each program, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation polls the community over social media to determine what topics in remission are most important to you. You chose and we listened, so our third program of the year is focusing on IBD diets. Research has suggested that these diets can be beneficial in managing IBD symptoms, and the goals of these diets is to decrease inflammation, ensure nutritional intake, and maintain remission. So tonight, you'll hear a brief overview of recommended IBD diets, the difference in diet during remission or during flares, and how to communicate with your doctor regarding diet. The information shared is meant for educational purposes only and should not replace any advice or guidance from your own healthcare professional. The program will be recorded and posted on the My IBD Learning webinar website, um, cronesclitisfoundation.org slash myibdlearning. And everyone who registered for the program will also receive a link with the recording next week. We want this to be as interactive and engaging for you as we can make it, so we encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A box. This can be found in the lower part of your screen. And following our expert discussion, I'll moderate a Q&A session with all of our panelists, and we'll address as many of your questions as we can at that time. Just want to give a little bit of a shout out to our sponsors. Tonight's My IBD Learning webinar is generously supported in part by a sponsorship from Abvi. Additional support is provided through the Foundation's annual giving program and donors. So on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We're super excited to have you. So let's talk about our expert presenters. Tonight we have Dr. Harry Thomas and dietitian Stacy Collins. Dr. Harry Thomas is a gastroenterologist at Austin Gastroenterology. His clinical interests are inflammatory bowel diseases, and he served as a site principal investigator for multiple clinical trials in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis as well. He's active within the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and serves as co-chair of the National Scientific Advisory Committee's Patient Education Committee. He's also a member of the Austin Leadership Board and chair of the Austin Mission Committee. In addition to all that, he serves on the board of directors of the People's Community Clinic, a federally qualified health center in Austin, and is on the board of Texas Society for Gastroenterology and Endoscopy and the Digestive Health Physicians Association. We're also so excited to have Stacy Collins here. She's a registered dietitian with the J-Pouch herself, who's currently working um, and learning as an IBT dietitian apprentice at Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles, with the intention of expanding registered dietitian accessibility to people who live with IBD. She owns her own Texas-based virtual nutrition private practice, where she works primarily with people who have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and microscopic colitis. She has a special interest in working with people to help them feel nutritionally supported throughout their IBD surgical journeys. She really enjoys collaborating with other healthcare professionals and patients through research and volunteer efforts to help amplify the patient's voice and integrate dietitians into existing GI care teams so that patients will always have a trusted resource to be able to answer the question, what can I eat with IBD? We truly understand the importance of your questions and want to ensure we can answer as many of them as possible. Tonight, we also have the honor of having dietitian Lori Beacon monitoring the Q&A box. Lori Beacon is a registered dietitian who has worked in the acute care setting at Scripps Green Hospital for the past 14 years, and she's currently working in the outpatient gastroenterology clinic at Scripps Clinic Torrey Pines. Lori specializes in working with patients with a variety of autoimmune diseases with a primary focus on inflammatory bowel disease. She has been fortunate enough to do research and work alongside Dr. Conagetti for the past three years with the hopes of shedding light on the profound connection between medical management and nutrition therapy for gastrointestinal diseases. If you have a question for Lori, please type it into that Q&A box and she'll do her very best to answer as many of questions as she can. Uh, keeping in mind, she might not be able to address every question. Following the conversation, though, with Stacy and Dr. Thomas, Lori will join us for the Q&A session. We're so excited to have all of our speakers here. Here are presenters' disclosures. Wonderful. So now we're going to get started with our conversation on gut-friendly diets. So I'm going to start with Dr. Thomas. Many of patients often struggle with making good food choices and find that what they eat really can play a role in managing their symptoms. So at what point would you suggest in their IBD journey that a patient would want to consider trying a specific IBD diet? 
Yeah, thank you, Macy, for that great question. Um, thinking about diet, we can think about different phases of a patient's uh, IBD journey. So, you know, the patient initially presents with IBD, and typically they have pretty uh, increased disease activity at that time of the initial diagnosis. And that's certainly a uh, time to start discussing diet and potential dietary changes. Then hopefully with a combination of diet and or medications, the patient then enters a period of remission uh, where their clinical symptoms uh, are improved and their um, endoscopy findings are also improved. And during that uh, remission phase, we want to kind of maintain the remission uh, by you know, continuing medications and uh, ensuring uh, appropriate uh, diet at that time. So that's that second bullet point here, the remission. Now, um, IBD is a, a disease uh, that's chronic and patients can have periods of relapse or you know, what we in, uh, flare ups. So during those disease flare ups is a time when we may have to make dietary changes again, um, uh, somewhat similar to the dietary changes when patients uh, may have originally presented with their uh, diagnosis. Um, so that's back to the uh, active disease, the first bullet point on this slide. So those are broadly speaking the times to consider diet. And then the other kind of special situation, which we may have the chance to discuss uh, this evening is around the time of surgery. So there are certain uh, changes um, that we can make uh, regarding nutrition prior to surgery, during the perioperative period, and then immediately after surgery that can optimize patients' uh, outcomes uh, if they do end up needing a surgery uh, for their inflammatory bowel disease. So broadly speaking, those are appropriate times to think about uh, dietary interventions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that info, Dr. Thomas. And kind of building off of that, Stacey, would you mind then telling us a little bit more about some of these diets that are commonly prescribed for IBD patients and also those diets that might work for children who have, with, who have IBD as well? Sure, Macy, this is such a great question. So firstly, it is important to acknowledge that there is an existing overlap between GI diseases and eating disorders, which are not choices, they are mental diagnoses. So it's really important to make sure that you have um, access to mental health resources if you need it and make sure that you're taking care of yourself or your loved ones before you proceed with today's conversation around medical diets, if you feel that you might be in a sensitive category regarding eating disorders. So the diets covered today, another important factor to keep in mind is that all of these diets have been studied, but they all had dietitians built into the study. So it's really crucial to make sure that you have a dietitian supporting you alongside your GI care team to ensure nutritional adequacy and the safety of your well-being and make sure that these are approaches that are sustainable for you. Most studies don't screen for eating disorders and medical diets are inappropriate interventions in the setting of active eating disorders. So I just wanted to be sure and make sure that it's very clear before I continue. So um, in answer to your question though, yes, exclusive enteral nutrition where patients would be getting 100% of their calories for six to 12 weeks with medical nutrition formulas. Um, most have to be titrated and dosed with the support of an experienced GI IBD dietitian. Um, these are more commonly prescribed diets in children than adults, simply because exclusive enteral nutrition, 100% of your calories from these formulas, has shown to be steroid sparing. And so since kids are still growing and um, may be hesitant to start steroids because they can be kind of, you know, a harder intervention on bone health, we want to continue to optimize the patient's nutrition status and their disease status. So EEN tends to be more recommended in children than in adults. Additionally, SCD or the specific carbohydrate diet and Crohn's disease exclusion diet have both been studied in children's and adults as well, and have been shown to be safe for all populations. Um, more studied in Crohn's disease is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, the Mediterranean um, diet pattern of eating. It's more of a pattern and an approach um, rather than a, a rigid set of guidelines. 
Um, as I mentioned, exclusive enteral nutrition and partial enteral nutrition, where you would be getting about 30 to 50% of your calories from partial enteral nutrition, not exclusive. Um, more studied in ulcerative colitis, we have low fat, high fiber, um, exclusive enteral nutrition as well, but in patients with acute severe ulcerative colitis, where, um, you know, they may be hospitalized very acutely, very, um, in a short term kind of frame between, you know, one day they were fine and three days later, they had an acute onset of a disease flare. In patients who have undergone IPAA or J pouch surgery, the Mediterranean diet style pattern has been um, studied along with more fruit um, that has been shown to increase, increase microbial diversity of microbes in patients who have undergone JPOP surgery. Um, partial enteral nutrition, semi-vegetarian, there's been clinical trials in these as well for making sure that um, remission can be maintained after surgery. And then we've also had um, some success in studying diets like IBD, um, autoimmune diet, or the ulcerative colitis exclusion diet, but really there's only about one study per diet. So we need a lot more research before we really understand these diets. Wonderful, thank you so much. Before we move on to the next one, any other special considerations when considering taking on an IBD diet that you wanna describe at all? Sure, I think that's another excellent question. Um, it's important to approach your care team whenever you're considering an IBD diet to make sure that your micronutrient labs are being monitored as well as your disease course. I would encourage patients to think of an, a diet intervention just like they would a medicine intervention. And you, you wouldn't try a new medicine without letting your doctor know. So similarly, it's important to discuss that with your IBD care team as well. Um, considering cost, considering how to make it sustainable. I think a lot of times patients really want to jump into these approaches like head first, all or nothing, right? As a IBD people, we can be very uh, high functioning sometimes and, and really, really over, overdo it. But it's important to really weigh the costs and the pros and the cons and how to make it sustainable and talk through that with a, your trusted medical team. Yeah, I think those are fantastic considerations to keep in mind. Thank you for that. So Dr. Thomas, not everyone does want to follow a strict diet and some patients might want to make changes with regards to their food choices more based on how they're feeling. So would you mind taking us through what you typically recommend for patients to eat when they're in a flare up versus when they're in remission? I know you've talked a little bit about it, but would love to hear more. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when patients are flaring, and this may also include when patients initially present uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, um, we generally advise um, avoiding uh, trigger foods. And trigger foods are foods that uh, don't necessarily cause inflammation, but uh, do trigger uh, worsening symptoms, such as uh, cramping, uh, bloating, diarrhea. These can include um, uh, foods that are high in insoluble fiber as well as um, uh, soluble fiber, uh, foods that are high in dairy, um, foods that are greasy or fried, spicy. Um, we generally avoid um, uh, you know, large amounts of caffeine or alcohol, uh, because they can definitely be triggers for, you know, many patients. Um, we do also recommend avoiding uh, foods that are high in sugar, uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, added sugars, because they can kind of promote uh, a lot of symptoms uh, for many patients. Um, and then high fat. So generally during um, a flare, we lean towards the foods that are listed here in this middle column on the slide. So lean proteins, um, uh, white meat, uh, fish, uh, plant-based proteins such as tofu, and then healthier fats uh, such as avocado, olive oil, nut butters. Now, fiber can be um, consumed during the flare, but we, uh, think more about well-cooked vegetables rather than raw vegetables. Um, and then in terms of grains, uh, sourdough uh, can be uh, kind of easier to digest, white rice, white pasta. Now, in terms of the fiber, uh, it is worth uh, noting that, you know, for certain patients, they may be recommended to consume more of a low fiber diet. 
in the event of a flare, uh, especially if they have a narrowing in the intestine. This um, applies especially to patients with Crohn's disease who may have a stenosis or stricture in the small intestine, and uh, they may be recommended to uh, consume a low fiber diet, especially in the context of a flare. And it is important to you know, stay focused on hydration with electrolytes, um, you know, oral rehydration solution, uh, et cetera. Um, so those are some of the kind of general recommendations during a flare. Um, also um, small meals. So, you know, four to six small meals per day um, and, you know, really focusing on adequate protein intake because the, during the flare, your body actually needs more protein than, you know, during the steady state uh, remission. Um, and aiming for that diversity in the diet. Now, when the flare is getting better, uh, then you would want to slowly start reintroducing foods. It would be helpful, uh, especially at this point, to keep a food journal, uh, you know, as you reintroduce some of those foods, just to note your symptoms, because that can help to identify, you know, which foods may be triggers for, you know, uh, symptoms in your particular case. Um, and then slowly start expanding the diet um, with more, uh, especially plant-based foods, uh, nuts, fruits, vegetables. And if you're still having uh, some symptoms, uh, despite being in remission, then it's worth speaking with your healthcare provider about trying more specific diets, such as the low FODMAP diet, which is kind of mentioned here on the slide, and we can discuss in, in more detail later. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I think it's great just to know that, you know, your diet can adapt with how you're feeling and it's not just a, not something you have to follow all the time, even when you're flaring. So that's fantastic. So kind of our last major point here, I'm going to direct to both of you. So what advice do you have for patients who want to consider making changes to their diet? So just final words of advice there. Stacey, I'll start with you. Would you mind sharing just those final points to keep in mind when it comes to making these changes? And then Dr. Thomas, if you don't mind just talking a little bit about what questions questions patients should be asking their doctors about diet at their next visit um, to kind of summarize here. Sure. So if you are losing weight unintentionally, this is something that you absolutely should mention to your care team. Usually clinics are pretty good these days about asking you before you see your doctor, have you lost any weight? Are you noticing your clothes fitting looser? Do you have a decrease in your appetite? These are all really important signs that you might not be meeting your nutritional demands. And I just want to highlight that they, that may not be any fault of your own. Um, sometimes the disease, when it's in an active state of inflammation, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, um, you do require more protein and a little bit more fluid to help with that digestive process and a little bit more calories. So it's really important to keep in mind that if you are noticing these nutrition deficits, you're experiencing those in your body to let your care team know so that they can help you make an informed decision and, um, you know, connect you with a dietitian who can help support you through that. Um, there's also so many excellent resources available for people on medical diets that we're going to be talking about today. And I know Macy, you're going to talk more about gutfriendlyrecipes.org, but, um, I just want to highlight that a lot of resources like this are developed by dietitians for patients, and it's really meant to be a uh, complementary to the help that you would receive through the help of a trusted IBD dietitian. I know that we can be really difficult to find out there, um, but definitely ask your doctor for a referral to see one if one isn't already integrated into your clinic so that you can be sure that you're getting full support. Um, and again, I really can't stress the importance enough of just like sending a nice portal message to your nurse practitioner or PA and say, Hey, just so you're aware, I'm going to be starting this diet. And I wanted you to know so that whenever we're monitoring my medication, we can also be monitoring my nutrition status as well. Awesome. Yeah, and Dr. Yeah, if you want to just pinpoint some of those questions to chat with your doctor about, that'd be awesome. Yes, absolutely. I, I completely agree with everything Stacey said. I think in terms of questions to ask your IBD care provider, um, I would, um, you know, lean on them because they're going to be the ones who know most about your disease history, your current disease activity. So they really should be able to guide you. 
Um, you know, I've certainly seen patients in my practice who tell me they, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they were told to avoid nuts and seeds. And they've been, you know, following those recommendations kind of religiously all those years, uh, when it may not have necessarily uh, been, uh, you know, uh, mandatory for that particular patient. You know, our thinking about diet has changed over the years. And it's definitely worth asking them, you know, if you need to be on a low fiber diet or if there are any other diets that are recommended given your disease uh, activity at this present time. Um, the second bullet point here is very important. You know, frequently we will check these specific nutrition related labs at the onset uh, of disease and then periodically thereafter, as well as bone mineral density scans to check for any signs of uh, reduced bone mineral density or osteopenia, osteoporosis. And depending on the baseline values, we may need to repeat that at certain frequencies uh, to get a sense as to how the patient is doing in terms of their nutritional status. So that's very important. This third bullet point is very important. What sort of risks would I be looking at with the diet? You know, we think about diet as being a relatively uh, low risk intervention in general, but, you know, it is worth considering that you know, especially some of the more restrictive diets that um, uh, Stacy included on uh, the slide, they do have downstream effects on the diversity of our gut microbiome. So that's the, you know, millions and millions of, you know, bacteria and other microorganisms that live in the GI tract. And although, for example, the low FODMAP diet can certainly uh, improve uh, certain symptoms, you know, bloating, diarrhea um, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, as well as irritable bowel syndrome, we do know that it does have an effect on decreasing the diversity of our gut microbiome. So it's, you know, there are, you know, pros and cons, risks and benefits uh, with uh, certain dietary interventions, just as there are with medications, uh, albeit different. Uh, so it is worth thinking about the risks of uh, the diet and whether it needs to be followed long term. Um, Next, you know, how do you know if the diet's working? I mean, certainly, um, you know, the patient uh, themselves may notice an improvement in symptoms, but it's worth considering if you're going to be checking uh, certain labs, for example, some of the inflammatory markets, CRP, fecal calprotectin, um, just to get a sense as to whether there are objective changes in addition to those symptomatic improvements with any intervention that we make for patients with IBD, including medications and diet. And then in terms of, uh, you know, additional support that you can get, I think this is really important. Um, you know, uh, many patients are lucky to have access to IBD-focused dietitians, such as uh, Stacy and Laurie here uh, with us this evening, but unfortunately many are not, um, you know, because... Uh, of, you know, the area they live in, you know, one of the uh, kind of uh, advantages that we've seen in recent years is uh, more telehealth. So even though there may not necessarily be an IBD focused dietitian in your uh, town or city, you may be able to access their services remotely by telehealth, for example. But um, uh, it's definitely worth asking your uh, IBD care provider about resources they can connect you with. And then, you know, one really important point that Stacey mentioned that I'd just like to highlight is in terms of the Mediterranean diet, which I think a lot of the evidence right now is really leaning towards the benefits of the Mediterranean style diet for patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, as well as, you know, other conditions, cardiovascular uh, disease, for example. It's, it's worth remembering, just as Stacey mentioned, that this is a Mediterranean pattern, uh, not just a diet, but lifestyle. So in addition to focusing on, you know, olive oil and, uh, you know, whole wheat grains and fruits and vegetables, it also includes, you know, eating with others, um, you know, physical activity is tolerated. Um, you know, uh, eating slowly, mindfully. And, you know, one of the uh, big part of this is mental health. We know that's critical for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, other factors, you know, getting adequate sleep, you know, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And these things kind of go hand in hand in terms of kind of lifestyle interventions for patients with IBD. Um, so those uh, are all, I think, good questions to ask your IBD care uh, provider. And, um, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll have uh, more, more discussion in the Q&A.
Yeah, thank you both so much for for that information and for weighing in on all these key questions. And yeah, now we're excited. We're gonna get to take some direct questions from the audience. And I'd love to welcome Lori Beacon back onto camera, who's been answering questions for us throughout um, in the chat. So now we're gonna direct a few of the audience questions to our live expert presenters. And remember, if you have a question for Dr. Thomas, Stacy, or Lori, please feel free to type it in the Q&A box. And that's in the lower part of your screen. Awesome. Nice to see you, Lori. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. So our first question, and um, this is for anybody, so feel free to go for it, um, whoever's ready. But one of our viewers, Laura, says that she'd love to hear more about how one could change diet before surgery and during recovery. I know we talked about it a little bit, but let's get more into it. Stacey, you want to take that one? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I just so, figured out great perspective on this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, surgery is my favorite of the populations. I love them all. <laughs> I, that's why I'm here. I love, I love IVD and nutrition, but, um, obviously, uh, love, love surgery too. Um, for the reason being a lot of people, if you're on the call and you've gone through surgery, I'm sure you've been given a handout that said low fiber and gave you like five cool foods to eat. And you were like, cool, well, I've exhausted all of those. Like what else can I eat? So um, a good way to optimize your diet before surgery is to just optimize your diet before surgery as, as much as you possibly can. Um, so that might mean working with um, a dietitian and a physical therapist to make sure that you are gaining muscle before surgery. You want to go into surgery thinking of it as you would run a marathon. You don't run a marathon without proper strength training and proper nutrition. Obviously, I'm talking from a place of privilege with complete regard to the fact that people don't always have this choice or this privilege because they are rolled into emergency surgery, which can save their lives. But in the event that you know your surgery is coming up, I would say to really focus on um, calorically dense foods, nut butters, grains, if these are safe and available options for you, work with a dietitian to make sure that you're consuming maybe a medical nutrition formula that's appropriate for your caloric requirements. There are certain protocols that as dietitians with IBD, you were trained to help patients through to make sure that you're nutritionally optimized before surgery. The night before surgery, we like to carbohydrate load patients in a way that works well with your bowel prep. So that would be another clear liquid option that you would work through with a dietitian and the support of your surgical and GI teams. Um, during recovery, there's research that suggests that it is safe in most populations to eat within a four hour window um, waking up from surgery. We don't um, necessarily employ that at every institution though, because every person will have a different medical status and a different surgical provider and a different um, institutional protocol that they'll have to adhere to. But we do see over and over in research that if we can get a person eating even liquid nutrition as soon as possible, whenever they're back in their room and recovering from surgery, um, moving as quick as possible on your feet, um, even though it's uncomfortable, and it's very painful. And then just gently increasing um, protein and calories in a way that is in alignment with what your body needs and is safe for you. This is a protocol that is really, really clinical heavy. And it's very important that you have the support of a dietitian. Um, and I know I'm saying this knowing that it's really difficult to find a dietitian, but um, the large big picture takeaway is strength and calories and protein and hydration and before and after. And that might look differently because you might have different texture modifications that you have to make on either end of that spectrum. I hope that answered that question. Absolutely. Thank you for that. that was fantastic. Um, thank you for all of that. Our next question comes from Robin and Lori, I'll direct this one to you. Um, she wants to know more about trigger foods. So what symptoms would you see after eating a trigger food or what would you look for when um, noting down if something is an inflammatory food to you or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So most often when we're looking for trigger foods, it's really the foods that just don't sit well with us, right? Digestively, we don't feel well after consuming them. Potentially that could mean more bloating and gas. Um, potentially that could mean altered bowel habits, right? Whether it's causing diarrhea or even abdominal pain. Um, and sometimes we can even say, gosh, you know, overall, I just don't feel like that, that 
gave me much energy or I feel extra lethargic, right? Um, and I think trigger foods, again, it's kind of a loaded question and very individually based, you know, so we can't necessarily say that all foods are inflammatory for every individual. Um, and it's really important to understand what works for you may not necessarily work for the next person. I always tell my clients, your GI tract is specifically yours. It's not like anybody else's, right? So really understanding which foods fuel you, make you feel really good. You know, maybe it's a higher carb diet that you do really well with um, and you modify your protein intake, right? Or maybe it's the exact opposite. So really finding foods that fuel you. So typically trigger foods are ones that just do not sit well with you, maybe causing pain, abdominal distension, bloating, even reflux at times, and then altered bowel habits most often. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'll direct this next one to Dr. Thomas and Sherry in our audience just wants to know a little bit more about what tools are out there for finding, you know, menu options or food options that go with certain diets. So what tools can you use to kind of um, make that a little bit easier, make meal prepping a little bit easier, things like that? Do you have any yes. advice on that? Um, you know, um, we are very lucky to now have a resource uh, through the um, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, uh, which is a gut-friendly recipe uh, finder. And uh, this is um, just a great breakthrough. We've worked uh, quite hard on this uh, over the last uh, couple of years or so, and it just went live uh, within the last year. Um, it, the uh, website is uh, Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org uh, forward slash gut friendly recipes. And um, this is really very nice indeed. So basically, you can go to this website and then uh, it has lots of different recipes that are uh, broadly categorized under different styles of diet. Some of the diets that you saw in Stacey's slide, Mediterranean style diet, um, specific carbohydrate diet, et cetera. And you can, you can search based on your own individual, uh, you know, uh, dietary exclusions, uh, the type of meal, uh, the type of diet that you're interested in, you know, special occasions. And uh, it's, it's really very nice indeed. So if you haven't seen this already, I would strongly uh, encourage you to check it out. Yeah, I can personally attest as well, literally life-saving when it comes to recipe planning and getting out of, you know, a food rut when you're stuck in the same recipes. So would highly recommend that tool as well. Thanks for talking a little bit more about it. I think it's a great resource. So next question comes from Rocky in our audience, and um, maybe we'll bounce back to you, Stacy. but feel free, anybody to answer. If a person has Crohn's or colitis with constipation as a symptom, would that differ in your deciding factor of diet choice or kind of how would you take that into account? Absolutely. This is a fantastic question because so often when we talk about IBD, we're talking about frequency and urgency of symptoms, but that's not how it's presented and experienced with a lot of people with IBD. So I always want to talk about fluid whenever I'm talking to patients who have constipation issues. And that's because um, fluid is really important for making sure that things continue you moving through our GI tract. So making sure you're aiming for about three liters of water a day. If you don't have any um, kidney issues, if you don't work with a ne nephrologist already, that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, it's also important to consider movement. And I know these sound like very basic interventions, but they're very powerful whenever they're implemented and sustained over a period of time. So I'm very guilty of sitting at my desk, like a gremlin and having to set timers to get up and walk and move about. But it's really important to do that for your GI tract as well. Another thing to consider is fiber in your diet. So sometimes people have experienced negative outcomes with fiber, but what we know is that fiber and texture diversity in the diet, as long as you don't have stricturing disease and need that to be heavily monitored and individualized, generally speaking, fiber diversity and texture diversity in your diet is going to really promote um, both um, contraction of the smooth muscle of your GI tract to keep moving those waves of peristalsis of digestion along so that the food is continuously moving. Um, so if you're eating, you know, a few of the same foods over and over, 
we'll use the example of a grain, say rice. Maybe you could switch that out for oats or sourdough and include it with um, another high fiber. Maybe, maybe it's not a salad for you. Maybe you're just going to do some really nice cooked down squash. Maybe you're going to do, um, you know, some raspberries, like try to um, diversify your diet in a way that, um, you know, little swaps at a time, but try to avoid um, eating the same foods over and over and over and over. Cause I know we can all be guilty of um, falling into that and it can be really protective, but on the whole fiber diversity, texture diversity is going to help along with movement and fluid. Fantastic suggestions there. Um, Lori, I'll send this next one to you. One of our viewers is a vegetarian and they're wondering how they should balance things like dairy in their diet and making sure that they're getting adequate protein without eating meat? Absolutely. Great question. Yeah. Most often it kind of just depends on what your body's most receptive to from a protein source. Our primary vegetarian sources of protein would be things like beans, lentils, legumes, nuts, seeds, um, tofu, tempeh, a lot of those, right? Um, and if they're including fish, not sure if they are, um, but if they are, that's a great resource as well for a lot of lean protein. Um, you know, having said that, modification of those textures can be really important, especially when it comes to things like beans, lentils, legumes. A lot of people kind of, um, you know, either scrunch their nose up to it saying it creates too much bloating and gas for me. Well, there's certain ways to modify, right? Whether it's soaking overnight, whether it's rinsing really, really well, whether it's um, blending or pureeing, you know, I'm oftentimes we can tolerate hummus likely better than we can tolerate a full chickpea at times, right? So in those certain circumstances, we can modify the texture of the protein and really enhance it. Um, there's a number of other things too. If you can't tolerate nuts and seeds really well, choose smooth nut butters in order to offer a lot more protein and um, get kind of the benefits from that standpoint. Um, adding these things to like soups and smoothies too, you know, so it's not always just like having to eat them outright, right? They do wonderfully um, as we can blend them into soups and smoothies as well. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Awesome advice there for sure. Dr. Thomas, to you, um, I know you talked a little bit about getting blood work in the past to see how effective diets are for you. So do you recommend comprehensive blood work to track things like iron and vitamin D? And if so, how often would you recommend that patients do those? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so yes, usually we do check those uh, kind of micronutrient levels at least once a year for uh, many of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So this will include the iron uh, studies, um, you know, and low iron levels can be associated with anemia that you'll see on the more regular blood work, such as the uh, CBC complete blood count, but uh, the iron studies you know, give you more details about that. Then uh, folic acid levels, vitamin B12, vitamin D. And then there are other micronutrients that are more, more rarely uh, uh, depleted in patients with IBD, including um, zinc uh, and vitamin B6. And so um, I, I would definitely ask your um, healthcare provider, um, you know, as to how often they want to uh, keep an eye on those levels uh, to screen for any deficiencies, because we know that those micronutrient deficiencies uh, are relatively common in patients with IBD. Great advice there. And so Stacy, I think this will probably be our last question for the night. Um, what do you think about protein shakes? Do you recommend them? Do you not? What are your thoughts there? One of our audience members wants to know. Um, this is a great question. And if you don't mind, I'd also like to kind of piggyback, piggyback a little bit off of what Dr. Thomas was saying, because he made some Yeah, go points. for it. Okay. Um, 100%. Okay, good. hundred <laughs> percent in agreement with everything. I just also wanted to add that um, we we never supplement just in case. We have to make sure that um, these are labs that are being monitored diligently um, because sometimes when we supplement just in case, we can cause other nutrients to be depleted. For example, zinc. A lot of times people are taking zinc and it's not too uncommon to see um, copper deficiencies and that can kind of result in heartbeat abnormalities. So we want to test and, and we don't want to guess. 
So I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of that. Um, but in answer to your question about the protein, yes, you can absolutely um, utilize a protein shake if you want to during a state of active disease flare, especially, or recovering from surgery. The issue with protein, however, is that anytime we increase protein in our diet, in any way, we want to increase fluid so that we're avoiding things like constipation. Oftentimes as patients, if you experience a lot of frequency and urgency, you may not think that you're constipated, but there's actually, we can see on CT scans, there's still like a stool burden in the intestines. So um, making sure that anytime you increase protein, you're also increasing fluid. Most importantly, though, it's important that you're getting a supplement that is third party tested. So um, our bodies optimally metabolize about 20 to 30 grams of protein at a time. A lot of times these supplements will tote, you know, 45 grams of protein, but our, our body really knows what to do with like 20 to 30 grams of protein at a time best. Um, and we want to get that from a source that is food-based first. If you find that you're unable to meet your protein demands through food, which is the safest, which is going to interact with other foods in a way that is beneficial and powerful for your body. And we know this extensively through the research. It's okay to consider a protein supplement, but I would verify that it's third-party tested. Not everything on the market is, most are not, and a way to ensure that it's third-party tested to make sure that all of the ingredients that are in the label is what's actually in the formula that you're consuming is to make sure that there's a label on the side that says USP certified, NSF certified for sport, so USP, NSF. Um, those are two telltale kind of labels that you can check to make sure that that protein supplement is third party tested um, because there's no burden of accountability for the government to, um, to, to regulate these things as vigilantly as, you know, we wish as consumers would happen. So it's important to make sure that it's third party tested for that quality assurance. Fantastic. Thank you, Stacy, And thanks to all of you. This was such a great discussion. And I think we learned some super helpful information today that that is super valuable. So the program comes to an end just on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. We encourage you to keep learning about IBD and to visit some of our helpful educational resources that are listed below. So first things first, the gut-friendly recipes, just want to plug that one more time. There's more than 500 delicious recipes on the foundation's gut-friendly recipes guide. Super user interactive, great resource, would definitely check it out. Um, to watch previous webinars and expert conversations, please visit Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org slash learning. I want to remind everyone to please fill out the evaluation survey that'll be sent to you after tonight's program. We really appreciate the feedback and it'll help us plan future programming. So thank you all so much for joining our My IBD Learning virtual program tonight. Gut-friendly diets, what's right for me? Thanks to our speakers and I hope our whole audience has a great rest of their evening.